Thank you very much indeed. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, of any audience I could think of in the whole world that might believe what I'm going to tell you now, it would be the MSF. <laughs> Truly. Uh, and and uh, just being here, the taxi driver last night, I told him I was with MSF, and he says in Swedish, oh, but they do good things. <laughs> and this morning we've heard some of those good things. Uh, and, and I was very encouraged by, 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 by the stories uh, and the TED Talks, the TED Talks uh, that we've heard. Uh, thank you very much for, for those uh, uh, amazing work you've done. And so uh, I would like to stretch your imaginations. Wasn't that the part of the MSF? Actually, in Cape Town, that's what you did. You stretched the boundaries of what was normal and acceptable. And so uh, this is especially for you. Kangaroo Mother Care, Physiological Response, Cultural and Practical Challenges. This is the title Mutz chose. Thank you. It helps me uh, to keep focused. I do also uh, want to declare that uh, I have a disclosure. I work full-time with this. Actually, I don't work at all. I play full-time with this. Uh, and I have a company called Neuroscience for Improved Neonatal Outcomes. And for 10 years, this has been my focus. What is the neuroscience behind this kangaroo mother care? We all talk about kangaroo mother care. And in the beginning, it was a bit of a kind of like a homeopathic kind of thing that we kind of started doing. And it still has a little bit of a connotation of being myth. And so, uh, I'm going to start by unpacking this in four pieces. Kangaroo mother care is a World Health Organization definition. It is a particular definition. It's got a strategy. It's published in this guideline that Mats referred to uh, that is uh, from the World Health Organization. It came out of the work of a meeting in Trieste in 1996, 20 years ago. Uh, and it's a kangaroo position, kangaroo nutrition, and kangaroo discharge. Now, those terminologies are lay terminologies. I don't quite kind of like them. But this combination of interventions is kangaroo mother care. Kangaroo care is something that's used in the United States uh, widely. And it's not this. Kangaroo care is skin-to-skin -skin contact done on a stable baby, kind of like a month or two down the line. It's a nice thing. It has lots of benefits. Many, many benefits, and they've all been listed in research. One hour of skin to skin has such a benefit. But it's called kangaroo care. I would prefer to put to you, please, to use the term skin to skin contact. This is, to me, a scientific term. And so uh, I have skin to skin contact as the use. So this 10 years that I spent doing the neuroscience of skin to skin contact, Skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact is a place of care. Contact is contact with mother. And the place in neuroscience, in any kind of biology, is environment. And here you see G times E, gene times environment. And so the environment interacts with genetic processes to make a behavior which is nutrition. Going too fast here. Because the babies are better feeding, and I'm going to unpack feeding for you, they go home earlier. So my view is not that skin-to-skin -skin contact, that kangaroo mother care is the package. Kangaroo nutrition is an outcome of skin-to-skin. That is actually also what the Cochrane Review, uh, more in 2012, more Elizabeth and I just updated it this month, <laughs> finally. Uh, and because of earlier, better outcome for breastfeeding, the consequence is discharge. And therefore, the key focus should be skin-to-skin -skin contact. Another little axe to grind. I don't like kangaroo mother. Well, care, hey, we must have care. Skin-to-skin -skin contact is not care. Care does not change. CPAP does not change. Uh, the surfactant does not change. Uh, it's a place that is changing, and therefore contact is the key thing. Terminology, if I can present that to MSF, please, to understand that it's skin-to-skin -skin contact, the right position, the right place, and a consequence. So uh, I have four of these slides. The first one says terminology does matter. 
Strategy, yes, kangaroo mother care is good, but the key deliverable is skin-to-skin -skin contact that elicits breastfeeding behaviors and the babies will thrive as a result. I could say a great deal more. Discharge, I don't think, is part of the reality of an intervention. Uh, when I started doing this in 1998, I discharged my babies late because they had to go two days on a scotch, on a donkey drawn wagon before they could go home. I sent them home when they were two or three kilograms, not early. So, what is the physiological response? And the physiological response, therefore, depends on their environment. This environment that makes gene interactions, that makes proteins, that makes behaviors. And therefore, this is the key adaptation, experience, and reproductive fitness. I'm going to show you a schema, a, a mind map, a big picture view. Uh, everything hinges on DNA. But the environment tells the DNA through epigenetic switches, new exciting knowledge. The environment gives sensory messages to the circuits that were formed by the DNA. That makes a behavior, that makes an evolutionary biology. Physiological responses in biology are determined by the environment, as is everything else. And therefore, uh, in the birth environment, the baby and the mother, you will appear here, see, bonding and sensitization will occur. Separation produces toxic stress. I spent 10 years drawing this picture, so you're not going to get a 10-year explanation, you'll be glad to know. Key is, am I safe? When I feel safe, we call this neuroception or threat appraisal. Then there is a physiology quite distinct from that of am I unsafe? Uh, separation produces toxic stress. Nothing an infant can or cannot do makes sense except in the light of mother's body. And therefore, some of what we understand about epigenes is because of life sciences theory and anthropology. And anthropologists make this kind of statement, except in the light of mother's body. So in the very broadest sense, this mother's body can be in the jungle surrounded by leaves or a concrete jungle surrounded by cement and plaster. It's the same skin-to-skin -skin contact that this environment makes the neuroscience of birth and breastfeeding. Skin-to-skin -skin contact is the environment. In this environment at birth, the organism must accomplish a primary task, which is transition. We don't talk about this very much, but there's a physiology of transition from extrauterine life uh, to air, uh, bigger pardon, intra to extra. And therefore, transition, and this has worked from this very institution where we are uh, over the last 30 and 40 years, the newborn that is transitioning in this environment has a higher temperature, has a higher glucose, all the long list of benefits that we referred to in, in talks this morning. And here is a neat explanation. This is a thermal image, heat camera, and this chest belongs to a woman and it's 33 degrees according to this yellow color scale. This chest is a lactating chest and that is 36 degrees. This environment provides the warmth the nutrition and the protection. Go back to grade school, the basic biological needs are obtained by the newborn organism in the environment. Warming, feeding and protecting behaviors are a package of needs provided by the environment at birth. Key to neuroscience of birth and breastfeeding. Intricately, inseparably linked to the right place. There is a bonding process, and again, just going to say a few things just to assure you of an underlying science. It's called regulation. Parental presence regulates an upstream process of bonding that leads to attachment. But similarly and parallel, a downstream process that ensures the physiology of hormones, uh, of settings, of physiological parameters, of behaviors. 
Uh, so there is a physiological control and there is a, a sociological, emotional control. Uh, and again, very quickly, uh, just the top pieces of the uh, iceberg that you saw yesterday. What we need to do is to support oxytocin. Oxytocin is the reproduction hormone. It's the health hormone. It's also the social hormone. And what we do at birth, notice that infant cues at birth, suckling, vocalization, tactile stimulation, makes oxytocin that combines with dopamine. And when you make sociality, which was oxytocin, rewarding, which is dopamine, uh, you get the engine that drives bonding, starting in the minutes of birth. And so, when you have rewarding sociality, uh, dopamine and oxytocin get connected. It does something else. The combination of oxytocin and dopamine enables us to control cortisol. And when we can control cortisol, we accomplish resilience. This is the definition of resilience. The capacity to maintain healthy emotional functioning in the aftermath of a stressful experience. And therefore, resilience is wired into the newborn brain in the first hour of life. That we didn't appreciate before. This has consequences for health. I've got slides on doe head and all sorts of things. But the summary of my neuroscience is this one slide. How am I doing for time? Don't answer that question. So, resilience <laughs> accomplishes health in the population as opposed to vulnerability in the population. We know that the population of preterm infants has high vulnerability because they come back. Uh, the insurance cost of a baby in the first year of life exceeds its cost in the intensive care unit. And so uh, there is uh, this neuroscience that underlies it. The key to this neuroscience working that you can see evidently in the physiology I would like to share with you very briefly uh, from the field if you like. And breastfeeding is the consequence of skin-to-skin -skin contact. This comes from Vietnam. Uh, this baby is 29 weeks gestation. It's 50 minutes old, and it has not been separated from its mother. And you will see that it is pink. There is no flaring. There is no uh, distress. And there you will see this infant going through a suckling burst. Uh, this baby is regulating. You will see it's opening its eyes just very mildly. When those eyes open, the circuit uh, of bonding is operating. Oxytocin and eye-to-eye -eye contact are directly linked. And therefore, not to spend too long on this, suckling is what this baby is doing. It will need feeding. <laughs> it will need to be fed. But suckling is a physiological behavior. That we must protect and elicit. I'll take you a step further. This baby is 26 weeks. It's a precious baby. It's number eight IVF. All the others have failed. And this is being given special care by one of the nurses. She's an employee in the hospital. 26 weeks. This baby is on oxygen. And that baby, and I could spend you longer here. I'm actually going to keep my time shorter. And I took out some pictures in case it didn't work. Notice the eyes are open. It's just on flow oxygen not even on the CPAP, that it may well need soon, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> uh, but here, without separation, this baby uh, is uh, stable in skin-to-skin -skin contact. And here you will see the mother, and from the video snippet, which is a bit longer than I've got time to share, that's its saturations. This is the physiology that is proof, evidence of successful transition to extrauterine life. Nothing an infant can or cannot do makes sense except in the light of mother's body. And this is such an infant at 26 weeks. You can tell the 26-weeker by the lanugo. And you can see that this baby is suckling. We protect the suckling reflex and it's fed with an earbud that's been dipped in the colostrum. And we will give it other ways. There's no orogastric, nasogastric food. This baby is a week old. Actually, in Zimbabwe, we would feed them just by dropping milk directly from the breast into the mouth. The baby can swallow at 16 and 18 weeks. And so, uh, 
Mowbray, Cape Town. Here you will see the baby on the bubble CPAP. <laughs> and here you will see the orogastric tube. And the baby's on the nipple. Suckling. We're protecting the suckling. You'll see the same picture in this very hospital in Karolinska Institute. Bjorn, where are you? Uh, this is Bjorn's slide. Uh, and there is a 26-weeker with a nice CPAP. <laughs> there we go again. CPAP. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it's on the breast. It's on the nipple. Yes. And because of that, we can decrease the FiO2 evidence that we're working with nature and not against nature. We are working with a safe environment. And in a very broad sense, uh, we go back to Bowlby. We spoke about bonding and attachment and the role of oxytocin. And then we had uh, separation, distress, and the role of cortisol and its enemy. And therefore, toxic stress is defined as the absence of the buffering protection of adult support. And this, I think, is a key phrase. I talk too fast for you to write, but if you want to write anything to remember, toxic stress is the absence of the buffering protection of adult support. It produces cortisol, and that disrupts brain architecture. And this has been elucidated in great detail, and I'm not going to go on to it. So this is the summary slide on the physiology. The highest order of physiological determination, am I safe? Neuroception, threat appraisal. In skin-to-skin -skin contact, there is a safe response of regulation, bonding, growth and development. The feeling of being safe produces oxytocin. <laughs> oxytocin produces these other things. It's not the magic bullet that you can give the oxytocin. <laughs> You've got to feel safe to produce the oxytocin. And therefore, uh, separation, stress, cortisol, dissociation defenses. In the very 26-week baby, this biology is working. The baby needs technology in addition. And then we protect suckling. That physiology, the suckling physiology, separate from the feeding, separate from the breastfeeding, which will appear, is the key first part of care. I thought I'd start with practical challenges, and then I will talk cultural challenges, because that we would, I think, have a better discussion on. Uh, and so, uh, practically, at transition, if it fails, a cascade of dysregulation begins. It's beginning with becoming cold, uh, hypoxic, hypoglycemic, and you can't unpack these because they're a package, a cascade, instability. Those unstable babies are excluded from KMC studies. And that is why kangaroo mother care does have an impact on mortality, but only on the mortality of survivors. <laughs> it will save 11,000 babies per year, not the million babies a year that MSF has encountered and therefore it promoted it uh, in your priority rankings. Uh, thank you for doing so. Skin to skin, therefore, has the ability to prevent instability by accomplishing transition. This is one slide from my experience in Zimbabwe, a historic control. Uh, there is a survival curve, uh, 1,500, 10%. Just skin to skin added, I've shifted the survival curve way down to the left, uh, making it smaller. I could shift it further if I had CPAP and, uh, and, CPAP, uh, and, 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 and surfactant down the line. I did not have that under those circumstances. And I've published this experience for mortality improvement in the journal called Tropical Doctor. Uh, the reason this worked is that they stabilized in the first six hours. This slide uh, shows a randomized control trial that I conducted some 10 years later. Uh, and it's the same effect you find here. Skin to skin in a randomized control trial did stabilize babies that became more and more unstable in incubators. So uh, there is an underlying scientific rationale, immediate Parent-infant skin-to-skin contact. Uh, fathers are parents, and they can be uh, grandparents, uh, partners, uh, any others can do this. Notice in the operating room we do this. Uh, and uh, my current work, together with my wife here, uh, doula protects oxytocin in labor. The kangaroo, 
kangaroo plus doula, <laughs> continues to protect this oxytocin in the first thousand minutes of life. And therefore, this is what she does. You don't see what she does. She just ensures that there is no separation. Fathers, here is back in Zimbabwe, a grandmother with twins. And therefore, to accomplish zero separation, to accomplish continuous skin-to-skin -skin contact, you need more than a mother. You need a, a father, and in Africa, almost certainly, another mother. Uh, any mother of the mother's choice. There is some detail on technique, and the one single factor is to do continuous skin-to-skin, -skin, you must fix the airway to prevent obstructive apnea. And you keep the baby in sleep cycles of one hour, and you do small, frequent feeds. And that's more the detail that I can say. You accomplish a physiological pattern of one-hour cycles, 90-minute cycles. So, uh, a slide that summarizes this. You will, of course, be having this uh, presentation in, in, in your notes afterwards. So, where do we go uh, with the cultural challenges? And here we could have more discussion. And here I'm going to steal two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Culturally, I want to suggest, use the word kangaroo with caution. When I came to Cape Town, uh, kangaroo courts were the order of the day. Street justice. Uh, it wasn't such a good thing to do to anybody, never mind a baby. Uh, in certain cultures, kangaroos have taboos and big negative things. In some cultures, you can use another animal that has a good connotation, like a squirrel. Uh, but actually, mostly, I heard a nice phrase and I wrote it down. Uh, where were you in Afghanistan? And the mother was? Growing the baby with the warmth of the mother. Now, you want to take that Afghan language word and shorten it and say, this is what you do, and you call it that. In Zulu, we call it ukugona, and it means hug, cuddle, the kind of word. So I'll be careful with the word. And the second thing, particularly to MSF, culture is not sacrosanct. Culture is in fluid flux. And there will be a culture in which you arrive uh, on the 1st of June. Uh, but uh, that was not the same 10 years ago or 30 years ago or in grandmother's memory. When we come, and particularly when we, and now I'm identifying myself with you as MSF, when you come out there, you bring a new culture. You can take the responsibility. You've done so all along. Uh, you did so successfully in the whole HIV environment for which the world owes you great thanks, and particularly if you come from South Africa, uh, where this was a huge issue. And so there is a culture that we can take responsibility and ownership for. These pictures come from Uwe Ewald's unit. <laughs> and there you will see uh, the incubator and all the technology, and there's an adult bed. You don't need to say a word. This man, when he arrives there, says, man, I forgot my pajamas. And you've created the culture that tells him that's his bed. That's where he's got to stay. Yes, you need space. Uh, Uwe is rebuilding this unit for the third or fourth time. Uh, and so we need space, of course. But this, we need the space because this is our biology in which we can provide care. This baby is 25 weeks and on CPAP. Uh, this is in Dunderud. Uh, here you will see the mother and the baby cared for, small, sick, same bed. Triplets. These are pictures from this institution. Uh, one, two, three, and you need father. You need to be a team. Cape Town, a very, very sick mother. She's in an ICU. She's getting a sixth dose of neprosol. And she's had a cesarean section, and her baby is on her chest. And so we can create these cultures. We have a responsibility for the care cultures that we have. We can make them work better by talking to our communities. Uh, our Muslim communities have been very supportive with us. Uh, they have, uh, we've spoken to the imams, and the prophet himself expressly uh, promotes uh, breastfeeding. And therefore, if we do this sensitively, we've had no difficulties in this environment. Few things to say. One more. Two more. This is the theme of two years ago. No life too small. World Prematurity Day 2015. Actually, is a life too small? We have this discussion here for 22 weekers. 
23, 24 weekers. And so, yes, but you also heard from the presentations this morning that the babies didn't come referred from the outside if they were below 1,000 grams because the community knows they're too small to live. And this is a reality in which we are. And so, uh, other factor, 22, 23 weekers in the third world, we don't know their gestations. I would like to take it from a totally different view. I've presented the biology. Skin to skin is the normal biology of preterms, all newborns. And so, from a purely ethical point of view, the convention of the rights of the child, the child's best interests are of paramount importance in every matter concerning the child. The World Association of Infant Mental Health, just two months ago, three months ago, uh, put out a position paper on the rights of infants. Uh, here it is. I will make it available to you if you can't just download it very easily. Uh, position paper on the rights of infants. Basic rights. Birth. Birth. And the Infant Mental Health Association is saying it because we now see impacts of birth on lifelong adult mental health. And therefore, considered vital member, infant status, equal value for life, the right to be given nurturance, love, physical, emotional safety, adequate nutrition to promote normal development. Ranzi, was, you were talking about uh, this, uh, yeah, yeah, you see, this is a basic right. And I want to add the last one. Specifically to the context, infants with life-limiting conditions need access to palliative services. One of our experiences in the broader kangaroo mother care community, and I use the word kangaroo mother care community, is that infants, uh, parents uh, that can have this opportunity to be with their infants that are dying, actually do very well. Yes, there's cultural sensitivity, but even in our culture, I must be extremely sensitive because it's not a cultural thing. It's more a personal thing. It's where that mother came from in her own life that's more impacting than the actual culture. And therefore, I want to suggest the pragmatic approach is to say that no life is too small to get basic human care, immediate parent, infant, skin-to-skin -skin contact. If the baby responds physiologically, you will add the technology that you have. And therefore, very briefly, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can put this later. So, so the evidence for this is missing, but it is on its way. There is a randomized control trial plan that will be out in three years. Uh, and uh, we will have four or 5,000 babies from Africa and Asia. Uh, and separately, we will look for mechanisms research. It will look at 1,000 to 1,800 gram babies. And kangaroo mother care will be the control group. And immediate skin-to-skin -skin contact will be the key. So, no life is too small for being in skin-to-skin -skin contact.